On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar titled, The Importance of Using a Qualified Medical Interpreter Webinar. My name is Jeff Bomboy, and I'll be your moderator for this program. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for the webinar. Elizabeth Perez is a bilingual patient representative and certified healthcare interpreter for UPMC Pinnacle. She has over 25 years in the medical interpreting profession, as well as a medical translation. Her healthcare career began in New York City working for Health and Hospitals Corporation before relocating to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where she currently resides with her family. She studied healthcare interpreting at Penn State University, studied advanced Spanish at Arizona State University, and obtained her certification as a Spanish healthcare interpreter through the Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreters. She also serves as one of the primary trainers for medical interpreting for their bilingual staff at UPMC Pinnacle. She is also currently in the process of obtaining her bachelor's degree from the Southern New Hampshire University in the fall of 2019. Elizabeth, I will now turn the program over to you. Thank you, Jeff. First of all, I would like to thank the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority for giving UPMC Pinnacle this opportunity to be able to share how we can meet the needs of our limited English proficiency and deaf and hard of hearing patients by providing a qualified medical interpreter so that everyone is understood. The objectives this afternoon, we're gonna be reviewing the laws and regulations in place regarding language access. We're gonna review the demographics of our LEPs, identify health concerns and issues when not providing safe interpretation, and we're gonna review the qualified interpreter's role, competency, and qualifications. The goals we are going to touch on are the Civil Rights Act, the Affordable Care Act, implications when not utilizing a qualified interpreter, the Joint Commission's roadmap, some competency, a pilot study, documentation, and two lawsuits, and some references. There are terms and abbreviations that I'll be using in this presentation um, that I wanna share with you. LEP is limited English proficiency. HI will be hearing impaired. TI will be telephonic interpreting. VRI, video remote interpreting. FTF is face-to-face -face interpreting. And everyone knows HHS, which is Health and Human Services. ACA, Affordable Care Act. CRA, Civil Rights Act. And ASL, American Sign Language. I wanna review these key terms that many get confused with. Um, I always hear, um, in my experience, everyone calling interpreters translators and translators interpreters. A translator are those who work on the written word and render a written message from one language to another. So if they are translating like a consent to treat or some written information, that is a translator. Those who work on the spoken word and render a message orally from one language to another, that is an interpreter. There are two distinct skill sets and someone can be both. In this presentation, you're also gonna hear source and target language. The source language is a language that an interpreter or translator is interpreting or translating from. A target language is a language that an interpreter or translator is interpreting to. So who are our LEPs? Our LEPs are persons or individuals who do not speak English as their primary language and who have limited ability to read, speak, write, or understand English. Our deaf and hard of hearing are individuals who have sensory impairments and communicate using ASL. And the blind have visual impairments. Let's look at some statistics. This chart was taken from the U.S. Census Bureau Statistical Analysis. You can clearly see that we are linguistically diverse here in Pennsylvania. With the new census, we will see an increase. We are already seeing an increase with LEPs here in Harrisburg. I'm also hearing from colleagues that most hospitals are experiencing the same. So in this chart, it goes over the languages spoken at home and their percentages. And the other are those that speak English, not very well, or well, and their percentages. From an article uh, written by Candy Woodall in February, 2018, on Penn Live, titled 13 Places in Pennsylvania Where English is Not the Dominant Language, she states that Pennsylvania is becoming increasingly diverse 
1.3 million residents five years or older do not speak English. Another 500,000 residents say if they speak English, they do not speak it well. The U.S. Census Bureau points out that in the United States, one in five residents speak a foreign language at home. Healthcare institutions have difficulty providing culturally and linguistically appropriate services for our LEPs. With our deaf and hard of hearing, although there are no accurate statistics, it is an estimate that 8.6% of Pennsylvanians have some type of hearing loss. This was taken from the Department of Labor and Industry, Office of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. So let's go where it all began. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. No persons in the United States shall on the grounds of race, color, or national origin be excluded from participating in or be denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. With the Affordable Care Act, the following information was taken from the Civil Rights Training for Health Providers and Employees of Health Programs and Health Insurance Issuers from the United States Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights, published July 2016. For the sake of time, we are only gonna to touch on the important points relevant to this presentation. In Section 1557, um, it states it prohibits discrimination on the base of race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability in certain healthcare programs. Reasonable steps must be taken to provide meaningful access to those listed as LEP, deaf and hard of hearing. Steps may include language assistance services, oral assistance, or written translation. A qualified interpreter must be provided free of charge. Organizations need to realize that utilizing someone who is unskilled, whether staff, family, or friend of a patient, there is a potential for harm as they may not understand the terms used or medical condition. When it comes to individuals um, that are, have are disability, it states that an individual may not be excluded or denied benefits or services because of a disability. We must provide auxiliary aids and services to individuals with disabilities free of charge. Auxiliary aids and services include, but are not limited to, qualified sign language interpreters, captioning, large printed materials, screen reader software, TTYs, and VRIs. As you can see, we have a legal obligation to provide language access to our LEPs and deaf and hard of hearing. So what are the implications for not using a qualified interpreter? A female patient comes to the emergency department experiencing a fetal loss. No heart rate is detected on the fetal monitor. The RN pulls one of the registration employees of like ethnicity. Employee is used by the nurse and provider. Patient leaves the ED content. Staff and provider are a bit confused with the patient's reaction to the news of the fetal loss. Within a week, the same patient returns in tears, stating that she experienced the loss at home and was bleeding very heavily. This time, a qualified interpreter is used for the encounter. Patient states that the staff member used informed her not to worry that when she returned to her next appointment, she will have a viable fetus and the heart rate will be heard. There are health concerns and issues surrounding um, the care without using a qualified interpreter. Um, from what we are seeing, and this was also taken from the Joint Commission Quick Safety article of May 2015, overcoming the challenges of providing care to LEPs, it states that it can result in a higher emergency department visit, a higher length of stay, greater risk for infection, falls, and pressure ulcers, difficulty understanding physicians and nurses, having difficulty with the plan of care at discharge, may not understand the care receiving, inability to take medication as prescribed, less likely to receive follow-up care or return, poor comprehension or retention, receive additional testing, wrong procedures, risk of medication errors, risk for adverse events, misdiagnosis, misdiagnosis, and of course, costly citations. We are also hearing from the community that many LEPs are not happy with their care. This can have a negative impact on their health and treatment. Some are going to hospitals where live interpreters are being provided. We also have concerns when we are utilizing family members or friends as interpreter. There's a risk of confidentiality, HIPAA violation, lack of medical terminology, misunderstanding, no formal training, cultural issues, multiple errors, they tend to dominate the conversation, 
They may not speak on the patient's best interest. They also may speak for the patient. It's also potential for malpractice, readmission, and again, costly citations. When using a non-qualified interpreter, you run into a lot of issues. Family members, friends of LEPs, or the deaf and hard of hearing are often used due to convenience, but there are, they are inadequate interpreters. Patient confidentiality may be compromised. Patients may be hesitant to share pertinent information about their care. Also, family may change the information to suit them and not the patient, such as a bad diagnosis. An LEP at a major hospital is being visited by a coworker who speaks the patient's target language. The CRMP enters the room and begins to use the visitor to communicate with the patient. Not understanding a lot of the medical terms, the visitor tells the patient that they're going to put something on her heart. The patient begins to cry. The CRMP quickly realizes that the patient misunderstood and gets an interpreter. She wanted the patient to know that she was just going for an echocardiogram. The next day, the patient is upset because the coworker had informed everyone at work about her condition and procedure. The CRMP had violated the patient's HIPAA and was counseled. There are also issues with non-compliance. This was taken from an article from Martin Healthcare written by Sabria Rice in 2014. Um, and the article was called, Hospitals Often Ignore Policies on Using Qualified Medical Interpreters. Most organizations advise against the use of patients, family, or friends who can potentially do more harm than good. Bilingual clinical staff also are discouraged from stepping in if they have not been certified as a medical interpreter. But physicians and hospital staff often ignore these policies, typically because of time, pressure, lack of knowledge about the availability of professional interpreters, or procedural difficulties in arranging for interpreters. So how do we provide a qualified interpreter? Prior to the Affordable Care Act 1557 standards, um, the Health and Human Services stated that all hospitals and healthcare institutions must provide a competent interpreter. This verbiage changed to qualified, indicating that the interpreter must show some type of qualifications. Just because someone says that they are bilingual or multilingual, it does not make them qualified. So what does make them qualified? Well, the Joint Commission put together this roadmap. Um, it's standard HR 01.0201. We're gonna start with number one. It states, define qualifications for language interpreters and translators to comprise a combination of language proficiency assessment, education, training, and experience. As you continue to hire diverse and bilingual candidates to meet the needs of your LEPs, we need to determine how we're going to assess their skill level in their target language. Again, not everyone who speaks a second language are proficient in that language, and those who are proficient lack training. We cannot pull untrained staff to meet our needs because how do you know that they truly understand what is being said? With number two, consider including certification by the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf or the National Association of the Deaf as a qualification for sign language interpreters. If utilizing staff, they should be registered and have their certification from RID and NAD. Number three, conduct an assessment of language proficiency in both English and the target language uh, for language interpreters and translators, or contact an external vendor to perform language proficiency assessments for these individuals. Bilingual or multilingual employees are a valuable asset to any organization. Entities need to understand that there is a secondary role and a mode of service that they provide. How, how are you gonna train them? How are you gonna assess them? Please know that I am not endorsing a specific program or product. There are many companies out there that can conduct language assessment. Here at UPMC Pinnacle, we use Alta Language Services to determine our staff's bilingual skills. In our hospital orientation, we gather the names of those who state that they are bilingual. Some institutions are assessing their bilingual staff upon hire to determine their level of proficiency in their second or multilingual languages. We are currently working with our human resources department to try to capture these employees upon hire and assess them before they step on a unit or department. This will allow the manager to know the language level of the employee hired. Those who are interested and have, a, and have been approved by their manager and who have demonstrated proficiency in the source and target languages are being assessed. 
and are now eligible to go through the medical interpreter training we provide. We utilize the cross-cultural healthcare programs Bridging the Gap medical interpreter training. Bridging the Gap is a nationally acclaimed program offered under license here at UPMC Pinnacle. The 40-hour professional development program is designed to prepare bilingual individuals to work as medical interpreters. After the 40-hour training, they are now qualified to serve as interpreters on their unit or department. The goal is for them to be nationally certified within the year. Some, some healthcare institutions send their employees to take a two to three day course to meet the Joint Commission standards, but they are ineligible to take the national exam as they are required, requiring those sitting for the exam to have taken a 40 to 64 hour course. As mentioned before, many state that they are proficient and when assessed, they receive an unfavorable score. Using homegrown interpreters has been proven to reduce costs since now you have homegrown qualified interpreters. In some institutions, staff interpreters receive additional monetary compensations once they obtain the national certification. Having homegrown interpreters, again, saves time, money, and increases patient satisfaction. Number four, promote ongoing training and educational opportunities for language interpreters and translators. There are many workshops, conferences, webinars, a certificate or certified interpreter can take to improve their skills. There are continuing education online that are available through IMIA, CCHI, and other companies. There are also conferences that employees can be sent and some are inexpensive. Number five, find out the qualifications of the language interpreters and translators provided by an external vendor or for contracted language services. If you are using an outside agency for TI, VRI, or FTF, you should find out what the qualifications for their interpreters are and what type of training they provide. You can ask for copies of the training and or certificates for each interpreter that comes into your facility. You are paying them and utilizing their services. We found out that most interpreters just have the basic training to fulfill the Joint Commission's requirement. There are concerns with the proficiency and accuracy of interpreters who only have a basic training. Number six. Refrain from relying on untrained individuals, including a patient's family member or friend, to provide language services. Please do not rely on untrained staff, family members or friends of the patient who are bilingual. If they have not been trained as an interpreter, they may not understand the medical terms used. Patients may leave your facility confused and unsure. If the family insists, you can have a qualified interpreter present to ensure that what is being relayed to the family is accurate. Number seven, consult resources from the National Council on Interpreting in Healthcare and the American Translators Association for additional guidance on the qualification and competencies to expect of language interpreters and translators. The NCIHC and the ATA are great resources, as well as IMIA, which is the International Medical Interpreters Association, as well as CHIA, the California Standards for Healthcare Interpreters. Using a qualified interpreter achieves positive results. Using a qualified interpreter improves communication and care being received, provides cultural guidance, clarifies medical and medications as prescribed, improves follow-up care, improves patient satisfaction, decreases ED visits, lowers length of stay, decreases unnecessary testing, decreases risk for adverse events, lowers misdiagnosis, lowers malpractice risk, and it meets the legal mandates. With qualified interpreters, they help facilitate and clarify any cultural misunderstanding. They provide interpretation faithfully and accurately. They understand style, register, high and low, and understand cultural content. They interpret accurately, they do not omit, they do not add, omit, or change. They are competent in the different modes of interpreting. And there are different modes. You have simultaneous, consecutive, and sight. Qualified interpreters provide the majority of the time is consecutive mode, where one speaks, then the interpreter renders the language in the source or target language, and vice versa. There's also simultaneous, especially with our psych patients in which the interpreter renders the interpretation at the same time this person speaks. And then site translation is when they are reading a document to the patient, such as a consent to treat. They also have their certificate or nationally certified. 
CCHI and IMIA medical interpreter certification is highly recognized. ASL interpreters qualifications, they hold RID or NAD certification. The, this one too is highly valued and provide an independent verification of the interpreter's knowledge and abilities, allowing them to be nationally recognized for the delivery of interpreter services. Qualify interpreters, um, they also differ from bilingual staff. So I always hear, well, they're bilingual, aren't they qualified? Bilingual staff may speak the target language, but they are not proficient. Bilingual staff who are proficient may have little or no training in medical interpreting or the importance of accurate communication in the prevention of adverse health outcomes. With qualified interpreters, they go through special training and, dip, and develop a different type of skill set. They abide by the code of ethics, they abide by the code of conduct, they maintain patient confidentiality, are compliant with all accreditation and regulatory requirements, the CRA, ACA, TJC, and the class standards, et cetera. They demonstrate proficiency in speaking and understanding both the source and target language. They are also able to assist with nonverbal cues. With the class standards, the principal standards, um, they are 15 standards, but we're only gonna focus on the ones that are important to this presentation. The uh, number one is the principal standards to provide effective, equitable, understandable, and respectful quality care and services that are responsive to diverse, cultural health beliefs and practices, preferred languages, health literacy, and other communication needs. Uh, with the communication with language assistance, number five, we offer language assistance to individuals who are limited English proficiency and or communication needs at no cost to them to facilitate timely access to all healthcare and services. We inform all individuals of the availability of language assistance services clearly and in their preferred language verbally and in writing. Ensure the competence of individuals providing language assistance, recognizing that the use of untrained individuals and or minors as interpreters should be avoided. So let's look at interpreters' competency. As recommended by um, the Joint Commission, interpreters used should have the proper education, training, assessment, and competency to deem them qualified. So with competency, these interpreters understand the United States healthcare system and how they function. They understand the patient's rights and responsibility. They're able to manage the flow of the session, remain transparent, interpret with accuracy and completeness, remain neutral, and they do not interject their own belief or advice. They stay away from anything that will influence their interpretation, such as biases and prejudices. They also have knowledge of medical terms in both the source and target language. They have knowledge of interpreting in the roles of the conduit, the clarifier, the cultural broker, and the advocate. So with the conduit, they give meaning and voice to the language spoken. As the clarifier, they check for understanding for both parties. The cultural broker checks for cultural understanding, and the advocate, what they do is they step in only when necessary. They demonstrate knowledge of language in the source and target language, such as order of words, when assisting someone who speaks the same language, but from a different country. They have knowledge, understanding of their own culture, as well as of the client. They're educated and understand regional differences, dialects of the source language spoken. When it comes to Spanish, you have 21 Latin American countries. So you have Puerto Rico, Mexico, Panama, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Peru, and the United States has their own culture. Those who are deemed proficient and who have been provided with the education and training will know that each country says things just a little bit different. The Spanish language has regional variances depending on location. Spanish is spoken in Europe, the Caribbean, South America and Central America. So one example, in the Caribbean, ahorita means a little later. In other Latin American countries, ahorita means right away. So imagine using a non-qualified interpreter. This word alone can cause someone an adverse event. If a medication needs to be taken as soon as possible and the qualified interpreter used, unqualified interpreter used is from Central America, they will say the word ahorita. But for the patient in the Caribbean, they're going to think, that it is later. Qualified trained interpreters are educated and taught the regional variances of other countries. 
This is just one word, but there are many others. In Arabic, there are 21 countries where Arabic is spoken as their official language. You have Libya, Algeria, Sudan, Egypt, again, as well as the United States. So the same can be true with the Arabic language. Culture and language uses can differ from country to country. Again, qualified interpreters are taught as well as attend workshops and seminars where this is addressed. With French, you have 29 independent nations, and this is new to me, where French is the official language. You have France, Canada, Rwanda, Haiti, Congo, just to name a few. As you can see, a non-qualified interpreter would not be versed in the variations. The Joint Commission had put out a pilot study. Um, uh, my apologies. This pilot study was conducted by the International Journal, Journal for Quality and Healthcare, published in 2007. They examined the differences in the characteristics of adverse events between English-speaking patients and patients with limited English proficiency in U.S. hospitals. They used six Joint Commission accredited hospitals in the United States. Their conclusion was that language barriers appear to increase the risk to patient safety. It is important for patients with language barriers to have ready access to competent language services. Providers need to collect reliable language data at the patient point of entry and document the language services provided during the patient provider encounter. A Spanish speaking patient enters the emergency room with stomach pain. It is determined that it may be her gallbladder. She is told she may need surgery, but the surgeon is waiting for the labs and the final reading of an ultrasound and scan. While in the ED, she had signed a consent to treat with one of the general surgeons in the event she needs to be taken to the OR and a qualified interpreter with yours. Two hours go by and no information is given to her in her target language since the signing of the consent. An ORA enters her room and gestures her to get on the litter. Patient complies. She is taken to the OR where surgery is performed, all the while no one has communicated with her in her target language. She, has admit, she is admitted on the unit for 24 hours, and during discharge, she asked the nurse with an interpreter present who was called by the nurse, what did they do to me? When the interpreter tells her what they had done, the patient begins to cry. She had no idea that the three incisions on her abdomen was a laparoscopic procedure done the day prior to remove her gallbladder. Now let's look at documentation. If, it did not, if it's not documented, it did not happen. It is important that you document each interpreting encounter. The Joint Commission on the Unannounced Surveys will do a tracer and will ask for an LEP's chart. They're looking at how, we are, our, how your organization is charting and if the patient's needs were met. If it is charted that a staff member was used, they may ask for their credentials. Make sure this is kept in the employee's file with HR or in their department or in your language department. We should, do all, we should also do, as healthcare institutions, do periodic audits and checks. When the interpreter is used, they provide you with a name or a number. This must be documented in the patient's medical record. Most regulatory agencies, such as the Joint Commission, are looking to see if this has been documented. So when an interpreter comes into your hospital, whether face-to-face, -face, VRI, or telephonic, they will give you the interpreter ID number, and it could be, I'm interpreter 54321. That needs to be documented. If the patient refuses to use the assistive device, you have to document that as well. If the patient wants a family member or friend to interpret, you need to document. But you need to use the assistive device with the patient to verify this, because it could be that the family is telling you that I'll interpret, but the patient may not want that. They may want a live interpreter. Some hospitals have adapted um, a waiver form. Um, here at UPMC Pinnacle, we do have a, we just adopted this new foreign language interpreter waiver form. Some institutions, um, once the patient signs it, it is placed in the patient's medical record. So what it states is that, um, that the patient was notified that, that we have language, and let me just read it. I was notified that UPMC Pinnacle has language services available for the hearing impaired and non-English and or limited English proficiency speaking patient or customers. 
the language service of telephonic, video remote interpreting, or quadrifolic interpreter are available to me at no cost. By signing my name below, it certifies my understanding of these fee services, but choose to decline. So once the patient signs that, then we have done our part. Um, if they come back and say, well, we didn't provide it, we have a document here. Now let's look at some lawsuits here. This was taken um, from a news article uh, from uh, the court allows the hospital to be sued over death services. This was in Tallahassee, Miami. A federal peers court has cleared the way for a lawsuit against two South Florida hospitals facing allegations that they did not properly provide interpreter services to deaf people. The patients who are deaf and primarily use American Sign Language to communicate filed a lawsuit alleging that the hospital failed to provide appropriate communication aids. The pair requested an on-site interpreter when they needed care, but the hospital used um, video remote interpreting. And the article goes on. They were able to win this lawsuit because there was no documentation that the hospital had done what they could to try to get a live uh, sign language interpreter. So what they did is just felt that the video remote interpreting was sufficient and that was it. Once your client requests a live interpreter, we must provide one free of charge. We must make every attempt to get a live interpreter and we must document those attempts, attempts because this is the, could be the result of it. There's also a lawsuit that uh, this family won a million dollars. So it says Memorial settles Spanish translation suit for $1 million. A two month old child at Memorial Hospital in Colorado Springs was admitted to undergo a surgical procedure to remove her left kidney. Her parents who speak and understand little or no English were led to believe that the surgery was simple. Court documents state, to their horror, the day after surgery, the infant began to deteriorate. The infant suffered complete kidney failure as a result of the surgery and is now being treated in Denver for dialysis and is now on a kidney transplant waiting list. The parent's child sued the hospital in May 2009, claiming that the city-owned healthcare system failed to provide consent forms in Spanish or offer trained interpreters. The parents did not understand the very significant risk of the procedure, including complete kidney failure and a life of dialysis and kidney transplants, nor were they informed of alternatives to the surgery, including monitoring the kidney for months. Um, and that's what the document states. Um, so Memorial and the girl's parents, they settled for $1 million. So in conclusion, if an interpreter is request, requested, we must obtain one free of charge for all LEPs and our deaf and hard of hearing. We must avoid the use of interpreting and translating websites or apps to provide interpretation and translation to patients as an alternative. So no Google apps no Google Voice and no Google Translate because it translates it literally. We must avoid using minors, avoid using family members or friends and ad hoc untrained staff. Use could be a potential HIPAA violation. Non-certified interpreters should only be used for non-medical conversations or ADLs. Please, again, and we're gonna reemphasize, please do not rely on minor children to interpret um, and the Joint Commission states, except in a life-threatening emergency where there is no qualified interpreter immediately available. A Napolese patient is being discharged from the maternity unit. The husband nor the patient speaks English. Staff utilize their 13-year-old son to interpret. He is asked to tell his mother that if she uses three sanitary napkins in an hour to call her OB. When the 13-year-old begins to interpret, the husband and the patient are mortified that we have given these instructions to their minor child. Several states have introduced legislation forbidding children under 16 from serving as interpreters. Untrained staff are more likely to commit errors in interpreting that can lead to adverse consequences. They do not have the medical training. Also, 
with your interpreters unless authorized by your legal department. Qualified interpreters that are trained by the, by the specific entity, entity should not provide interpreting services to external agencies such as Children and Youth, Department of Health, or any law enforcement. They need to bring their own. This was taken from Do Professional Interpreters Improve Clinical Care for Patients with Limited English Proficiency? Qualified medical interpreters are the answer to avoiding the issues healthcare institutions face when providing services to LEP and to the deaf and hard of hearing. We have a legal obligation to provide them with language services by utilizing qualified interpreters. Providers and staff also have an obligation to their patients to ensure that they are providing effective communication and that the information being conveyed is understood by utilizing a qualified interpreter, whether TI, VRI, or STF. Healthcare providers need to recognize that language barriers place LEPs at a disadvantage that can be overcome by providing better linguistic access. Without access to professional interpreters, this large and growing population will continue to suffer differentials in both health and access to quality health care. Use of professional interpreters is associated with improved quality of health care for patients with limited English proficiency, and findings suggest that provisions of professional interpreter services can reduce disparities in care for our LEP population. Healthcare facilities are serving an ethnically diverse patient population with an ever increasing population of LEPs. Qualified interpreters are needed with a homegrown agency. Qualified interpreters help facilitate and help decrease the divide between the patient, provider, and staff. If you are utilizing bilingual staff as interpreter, please know that they need to be qualified. Also, you may be putting the patient and the hospital at risk when using a non-qualified interpreter. Jeff, I will now turn the program over to you. Thanks, Elizabeth. That concludes the slide presentation portion of our program. Now we would like to begin our question and answer period. Uh, first one, Elizabeth, is, is the use of a phone interpreter appropriate for limited English proficiency individuals? It says, at our facility, this is the type of service we offer. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, yes, but if the patient requests a live interpreter, we must make every attempt to obtain one for them free of charge and document those attempts, especially when utilizing a video, video remote interpreting for the hearing impaired. Okay, thank you. Next question, if the patient would need a sign language interpreter, would it be appropriate for us to tell the patient that they would need to bring the interpreter with them? It is not appropriate. We must provide one free of charge, um, especially in our doctor's offices. If your doctor's office know that the patient is deaf, then their appointment is usually scheduled ahead of time. The interpreter can be arranged so that they can meet the patient at the same time of the appointment is scheduled. Okay, the next question we have, can you comment on bilingual staff who are not certified interpreters communicating with patients in their normal job roles? Bilingual staff can communicate with their patients, but they cannot serve as interpreters. So if you have a registration employee, they can speak to their client with the registration, um, let me get your insurance card. But the minute it comes into anything medical, um, like stating, can you please tell her what my her pain level is from one to 10, that is medical. That employee should not be used. Okay, next question. What are the citations if a qualified interpreter is not used and who would cite for that? The regulatory agencies, um, when they come in, uh, Joint Commission, um, if that is something that they're looking for, can give you a citation. If the patient calls Department of Health or Joint Commission, they will come in. It is considered a federal offense, and they will do an investigation. Okay, next question. What happens if there is no one available for a particular language when a patient needs an interpreter? That's a great question. According to Affordable Care Act, 
we should not rely on family members or children except for life threatening emergencies with no qualified interpreter. We had a situation where there was a patient who spoke Cano Canobal, which is an indigenous language of Mayan from Guatemala. The husband spoke Spanish and that language. So we were able to use the interpreter with the husband and then he was able to interpret to the patient because we could not find an interpreter for that language. In those events, we need to document that no interpreter could be found and that we had no other choice but rely on family. Okay, thank you. Next question we have is how can one become a certified medical interpreter? There are many programs out there. Um, the, the one that we teach on is the Bridging the Gap. Um, the CCHI has an online medical interpreter. All you need to do is research um, that you want to become a, uh, to, again, the first part is to take the 40-hour training, which will make you qualified, and that is a certificate. You will have to take a 40-hour to 64-hour training in order to be eligible to sit for the national exam. But there are many companies out there. Um, if the person or your employee lives in uh, close proximity to our healthcare institution, we'll be more than happy to train them. Okay, when I am performing pre-treatment calls to the patients, if they do not speak English and the family member answers the phone and begins to interpret, should I say that I will call back with an interpreter? Yes. I would recommend that because you are documenting that you spoke to the patient in the target language, but in all reality, you spoke to a family member. Okay, next question. Is it important to have a patient sign a waiver when declining services, or is it sufficient to document patient's refusal in the patient's chart? You can document that. Um, we decided to adapt the uh, waiver form uh, to be consistent. Um, and also, um, sometimes, and everyone knows, we get really busy, and at times, which I know that we're praying that it doesn't happen, but it does happen, we forget to write that down. So that's why it's important that your healthcare institution uh, pro does types of audits to make sure that we are documenting. The waiver form, what it does, it just, ha we have it readily available, and we can place it in the patient's chart. Okay, the next question, is your program available to outside providers and facilities not associated with UPMC? Yes, uh, currently we have trained uh, 32 outside um, interpreters um, from other healthcare institutions. But yes, they, uh, they can come and sit for our, with our class. We train internal and external. Okay, next question. You mentioned that outside agencies must bring their own interpreter. What about when they don't? Do we refuse them the services of the interpreter we have? And if we are using a team of both hearing and deaf interpreters for deafblind individuals, can we allow them the services of our deaf interpreter as not many exist and finding another one would be close to impossible? If it's a home, and again, I, I'm, I'm, if it's a homegrown interpreter and you are utilizing an employee, you have to check with your legal department. Because if it's for children and youth, law enforcement, and it's an interpreter that's, that's your, your interpreter for the hospital, homegrown and not an outside agency, I would check with your legal department. If it's an outside agency, that interpreter can call their agency and let them know that they just received uh, another assignment. Okay, the next question, how do you handle if the patient is a minor and the parent is deaf? Are we required to have an interpreter for the parent who would be responsible for the decision making and who would be responsible for decision making? Yes, when um, a client comes into your facility um, and they have a loved one with them that is responsible for the patient, we must provide an interpreter for that loved one. It does an interpreter have to be certified nationally? No. Um, the interpreter has to be qualified. 
So the 40 hour training we provide makes them qualified. And stated in the presentation, some um, healthcare institutions are sending their interpreters to a two to three day training. That makes them qualified, but it doesn't make them qualified to sit for the NASHER exam. L let, me, let me just say one thing. If asking for an interpreter, do I want a certificate interpreter or a nationally certified interpreter? I would rather have a nationally certified interpreter because they have gone through extensive training. Okay, our, I'm not sure what this means. Our code is C-O-D-A-S, acceptable, if a waiver is signed that they are aware. My apologies, I don't know what CODAS is. Yeah, I can't tell from this question. If whoever asked that question, if you could clarify that a little for us, please. So the next question, is it necessary to have forms in other languages or is English enough with the use of a trained interpreter? If you're high concentration, um, you can take a look at look at the, your data. Um, many healthcare institutions are con translating their forms into multiple languages depending on their high concentration. We have our consent to treat in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, Russian, and Nepali, and soon we'll be going to Arabic. Um, it is important uh, that you do translate these forms um, because the thing is, is that it's, it's better for the client to read it in their own language. And what should we do when we think the patient is not understanding the interpreter? Should we verify with the patient through the interpreter that they are understanding the interpreter? I call it teach back. It's really important that, um, that we do a teach back with the patient. So if you think that there's some, um, that the patient is not understanding, ask the interpreter to ask the patient what she had just said. And then she can interpret that. And if it's not what she had said, the patient is not understanding. If you have a telephonic interpreter, and the patient is not understanding the telephonic interpreter, you can request hang up and call for another interpreter. We have also done this. Sometimes you'll have interpreters that are from different regions. You may have someone who's from the Caribbean, patients from the Caribbean, and then you have a South American interpreter. And they may be some different variances that they're not understanding. We have at times um, disconnected the call and requested a Caribbean interpreter. And we have a clarification on what CODIS means. It means children of deaf adults. So are children of deaf adults acceptable if a waiver is signed that they are aware? Children of deaf adults should not serve as interpreters. You should um, obtain a live interpreter because the Joint Commission states that children should not be used only in um, emergencies. Okay, this is kind of a follow-up on that. It's not really a question. It says, we have an interpreter that is a child of a deaf adult. The deaf community love her, and we do have a waiver signed that they know she is not certified. The child is of age to interpret. It's not really a question. It's a comment, I think, on that previous question. Okay. Uh, so they don't have their, RI, um, their RID or the NAD. That's something that you, I would recommend that you research because the person utilizing should have their certification. They really should. Okay, next question. We have lots of questions today. This is great. Um, how do we sign up for the training at UPMC? Um, my email address, um, I believe that, Jeff, you can provide that to uh, the participants. Yeah, we will make sure that that goes out to them. Okay. Um, once you receive my email address, you can send me an email and I will send you all the information. Okay, the webinar will soon be ending, but we have time for a few more questions before the end of the program. Okay, here is another question. How do the patients know they have the right to request a live interpreter if they have only known to have a video call or a telephone call from previous experience? Um, patients, when they're admitted to the hospital, they receive a patient handbook, and in that patient handbook, the patient's rights and responsibilities is there. And Okay, here's someone. Okay. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that with our deaf um, community, they know to request a live interpreter. Um, some of our LEPs are now, um, if you have live interpreters in your facility, 
um, once they come into the facility, they are being told that they can request a live interpreter. Our transplant department, um, patients are requesting live interpreters and we obtain for them free of charge. Okay, here's the next question. Is each patient given rights and responsibilities stating that a live interpreter may be requested prior to the video call slash phone conference being started? Most of our patients, once they see that there's a telephonic or video, they're pretty satisfied with that. Um, some patients who are aware um, that they can request a live interpreter will begin to request live interpreters. Um, and I will have to research that. I'm not sure if there's anything written uh, with the, um, the, Affordable, the Affordable Care Act, 1557, that is, um, I know we have a lot of these postings out there, but I believe it does state that we must provide an interpreter free of charge. Okay, it appears as if we have no other questions at this time. Um, so we'll conclude the uh, webinar.